since time immemorial, sheep have provided man with food and comfort. Since the days when shepherds tended their flocks on the hills of Judea, their meat has fed him and their wool has clothed him. Because the animals have consistently supplied these human necessities, man learned centuries ago that it was greatly to his advantage to improve their quality and productivity. And so from the days when shepherds watched by night until our own time, the raising of sheep has developed to such an extent that we now speak of it in terms of sound investment, good business, and quality production. Many western range sheep are crosses, improved types combining the best qualities of numerous breeds that reach their present day perfection in types like this little fellow, who traces part of his ancestry to Spain, as does this highly bred merino ram, famous for his fine wool and herding instinct, both transmitted to the many crosses utilizing this breed. He and his French brother, the Rambouillet, were the original producers of fine wool, and for this reason have been used extensively in crossbreeding. This is the Columbia, one of the more popular Western breeds originated by crossing. Crossing is done to increase production of both meat and wool. Another Western breed originally obtained by crossing is the Corridale. The South Down, one of the five breeds first developed in the gently rolling country or downs in southern England. Another is the Suffolk, and this is a fine specimen of purebred animal. With the Shropshire, Oxford, and Hampshire, they form a group known as the Down breeds. The Targhee is a polled breed with an open face. The Monodale is one of the later developed breeds. This fine Hampshire is a good example of the contribution of the purebred breeder to the sheep industry. Many breeds have been developed through crossing in the sheepman's ceaseless effort for improvement in quantity and quality of both meat and wool. This effort will be carried on by future farmers of America, here being instructed by a vocational agricultural teacher. And here is Mary and her great big ram. She's grooming him for a show. And Mary, like other 4-H club members, is learning the practical aspects of animal husbandry. Sheep must graze well to keep in condition, so good teeth are essential. This lamb has a full mouth of milk or baby teeth. This four-year-old has a perfect mouth with permanent teeth. This broken mouth ewe will have difficulty in eating. The successful sheepman follows a continual program of culling his flocks and using high-producing rams. One culling operation is done before shearing and is carried out in this temporary corral on the range. Ewes that produce no lambs or whose meat or wool production has become impaired are removed from the band. This expert employs but a glance and a quick feel of the wool to determine the animal's condition. Sheep to be culled are marked for identification. At the Dodge Gate, the culls are separated to be disposed of later. The good quality animals are saved for the breeding flock. The importance of culling at frequent intervals cannot be overemphasized. The flowers that bloom in the spring mean lambing time, the success of which also has a definite bearing on the sheepman's income. The earlier the lambs are born, the better prices they will bring on the early market. But at this time, the lingering cold of winter produces the need for warmth and shelter and care for the new arrivals. This small tent is easily carried to out-of-the-way locations. It keeps out the wind, holds the warmth of the sun, and helps to retain the mother's body heat until the lamb is strong enough to stand up and take its first warm meal. The need for nourishment may be new, but it's urgent. After the shelter tent has served its purpose, it is quickly folded and is ready for the next brush call on the range. The canvas roof over this lambing shed is removed after lambing is completed. Pens are cleaned, and the sun and elements sterilize the shed before it is used again. The shed is a sort of improvised dormitory with separate stalls or roomettes, where mothers and their offspring are afforded protected privacy for the first few hours of the lamb's life. This cleverly constructed trailer is a lambulance. The top sections open up for easy access, and double-hinged partitions separate each family, while cribs are provided for the lambs. The shepherd's crook of ancient times is still in use today. The mother ewe is carried up the ramp and placed in her custom-built compartment. 
Hey, don't forget me. And thus, each little bundle of valuable merchandise is carefully gathered up and along with its watchful mother is carried away in the sheepman's miniature pullman to the shelter and care of the centralized lambing sheds, which is headquarters for lambing operations. At the lambing sheds, chilled or weak lambs may be saved by placing them in a lamb brooder. An hour or two in its warm interior usually revives them and restores their chances for survival. This little fellow, having gained his strength, already has a new outlook on life and will soon be returned to his mother. While the new lambs are gaining strength, they spend the first three to 24 hours in individual pens with their mothers. Then they are placed with other pairs in groups of from 10 to 20. This is a sort of conditioning or socializing process, permitting ewes to give their lambs proper care before going onto the range in larger numbers. Twins are a common occurrence, and they perk up profits. In from two to four weeks, the lambs' tails are docked. This is done with either a searing iron, a knife, or with its illustrator. It is used to put a special elastic band on the tail, which shuts off circulation, causing the tail to wither and drop off. Castration may be done with the elastrator at the same time. So that they will be easy to identify, the lambs are branded. During the lambing season, the ewes are fed an additional ration of concentrates. This builds up the animals after lambing, stimulates the flow of milk, and conditions them for the summer months ahead. Run, sheep, run is the game they like to play when the goal is pellets of dehydrated alfalfa. The spread of food keeps the ewes contentedly occupied nearby until the lambs are released. And here they come. Mothers, mothers everywhere, but not a drop to drink until they find the right one. During the first couple of weeks, the mothers know their lambs by scent, after which they identify them by the sound of their bleat. When the chill of winter is gone, and the ewes no longer need their heavy coats, they are ready for shearing. Most large operators own their own shearing sheds and employ sheep shearers who migrate from one ranch to another during the shearing season. This is another operation that causes sheepmen to reflect upon their possibilities for profit. The skilled shearers remove the fleece in one whole piece, which will weigh from five to 20 pounds, with an average of about 10 pounds. A good fleece is not only a milestone of success in a breed improvement program, but is also concrete proof of the economic results of careful culling. Each fleece is tied separately with paper twine. The twine has no fibers to become mixed with the wool. It is then tramped down into burlap bags that hold from 25 to 40 fleeces and weigh about 300 pounds. They are raised mechanically and the tops are sewed. They are then lowered onto hand trucks and after dating and weighing, they are marked for identification. Finally, the bags are loaded onto motor trucks and hauled to the local warehouse or railhead. Here, the wool clip is loaded into waiting freight cars. The doors are closed and sealed to ensure security, and another clip of wool is on its way to market. Back at the ranch, the ewes whose brands went with their wool must now be rebranded. The ewes are released after the rebranding ceremony. The lambs too leap for joy. Having been kept in holding pens during the interim, they are turned loose to join their mothers and the two groups meet in a sort of family reunion. The flock is then counted and turned out on the early spring range to graze in freedom once again.
This established fenced trail is a sheep highway to the mountain country where the grass is green. When the lowland ranges dry out, it seems to say, come up higher. And the sheep will as they follow the forage with the changing season up the green slopes to final summer grazing in the mountains. The camp tenter with his pack string carries supplies for the herder who goes with the flock to tend and guard them while they feed and fatten till the fall. This trail is part of the program for moving sheep from one range to another. On and up they go, following the rise of rugged terrain with a fixed and steady purpose, the search for good feed and summer range. They reach a high plateau, and while the herder and his dogs prepare to camp for the night, the sheep spread out to forage for their evening meal of mountain grass. With the rising sun, they hit the trail again to higher ground and breakfast. Each stop for food or rest finds them farther away from home, and wherever possible, they nibble as they go and gradually gain in weight and covering of wool. Here and there, the herder spreads a ration of salt as a necessary part of their diet. Always must he be alert to protect his flock, not only from attack by predatory animals, but from eating poisonous plants, only a few of which are shown here. This is halogeton, which is fatal to sheep if eaten in sufficient quantities. The same is true of loco weed. And water hemlock. The growth of morning glory, a noxious but non-poisonous weed, can be retarded by grazing a small band of sheep on it, like these on this western farm. A farm flock will vary from just a few head to several hundred. Their upkeep is economical because waste byproducts and homegrown feeds can be fed. They also assist in maintaining soil fertility. Here they are seen cleaning up a field of grain stubble. While this farmer is harvesting his crop of sugar beets, his flock of sheep do their bit and at the same time gain substantial nourishment from the beet tops left on the ground. In the shadow of this sugar factory, these sheep find an important item of their diet is sugar beet pulp a relatively cheap local feed, while these fellows content themselves and please their owner by keeping down the growth of high grass and weeds along irrigation ditches. These ditches not only hold a plentiful supply of irrigation water, but also provide an abundance of drinking water for sheep. In some localities where water is scarce, man must resort to the digging of wells to supply it. At any rate, regardless of cost, Fresh water is a prime essential for the health and growth of sturdy flocks. Watering troughs should be well constructed, built for the animal's convenience, and be easily accessible at all times. Streams running through rough terrain can be utilized to the sheepman's advantage. If brought under control, the water can be used to grow grass and increase the grazing capacity of his land. By employing this method of water control, along with reseeding, this land has been brought back to a state of lush productivity, sufficient to sustain this band of sheep. Improved quality of grazing land leads inevitably to flock improvement programs. This fine flock on this mixture of grass and legumes reflects the owner's pride in his stock and in his land. Where natural rainfall warrants it, gentle slopes can be reseeded with adapted grasses and legumes to increase the carrying capacity of the range. This is a lamb creep. The small openings permit lambs to enter, but keep out ewes. Inside, they are fed a palatable ration. They are also given mixtures of whole or rolled grain to develop them for the early market. Special attention is given to the feeding of breeding animals. Here they receive a supplement to their winter rations consisting of grain or other concentrates. This new tray enables the sheep to eat from either side of the plate. And here's another adaptation of the same idea. This commercial feedlot, where western-grown feeds are used to fatten western-grown lambs for market, is well-planned and constructed for the convenience of both sheep feeders and animals. The ingeniously contrived gate facilitates ease of operation in opening and closing, and is particularly adapted for handling sheep. Time or labor-saving devices usually gain the approval of sheepmen the West over. 
The sheep industry is confronted with the problem of controlling external and internal parasites. High pressure spraying of insecticides is used to control external parasites. Internal parasites attacking the digestive tract of the animal are controlled by drenches or licks of salt and phenothiazine. This is one of several sheep ticks. It sucks the animal's blood, causing it to become irritated and lose weight. Lice and mites affect the sheep in the same manner. These insect pests cause the sheepman considerable financial loss if not controlled. Dusting the animals with powerful insecticides is also practiced with good results. However, sheep scab is best controlled by dipping. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of lime. It sweetens the soil and destroys the breeding places of troublesome pests. The United States Department of Agriculture, after years of experimental research, has succeeded in producing open-faced ewes from a breed of sheep that were wool blind. A clean-faced animal produces annually about 11 pounds more lamb than the wool blind ewe with no loss in the wool yield. Compare this open-faced ewe with its unobstructed vision with this almost wool-blinded ewe which has difficulty in finding its food. And this wool-blind ram with its open-faced brother. Selective breeding gave this ram an open face and also eliminated his horns. Branding paint has always been a problem in preparing wool for use in fabrics. Samples of cleaned and uncleaned wool. The old type of paint was used on this wool, the new paint on this. The old paint must be removed manually at considerable expense. Branded with a new paint, this wool is clean. Sheep, like people, will usually follow a leader. Therefore, this method of trailing them is used extensively. This flock is beginning the first stage of its journey to market. Sometimes the sheep are taken to commercial feedlots to be fattened before making the trip, and some are marketed as grass fat lambs. Those shown here were grown on mountain range and will probably go direct to market. So they are placed temporarily in this holding corral from which they are soon loaded into trucks which will carry them to the nearest shipping point on the railroad. Great care is exercised in all transit operations to prevent damage or loss. Arriving at the shipping point, the sheep are unloaded. They descend one ramp, cross a holding pen, and ascend another ramp to the waiting cars. If necessary, they are rested, fed, and watered before being loaded. Note the palm frond this man uses to prevent the slightest injury. The car doors are closed and sealed, and powerful engines built for the modern combination of speed and safety begin the haul to the feedlot or sheep market. One of the great American institutions that represent our system of free enterprise, the stockyards. Here the sheep are sorted and sold, and the sheepman receives the well-earned profit on his investment of money, time, and careful planning to produce a product that helps to build and clothe the bodies of our people. Yes, the little bands of sheep that travelers see browsing in the yellow light of early morning, in the glens and on the hillsides, or in the waning dusk of day, are only a fraction of the 25 million sheep that produce more than 40,000 carloads of lamb to feed our people, and over 5,000 carloads of wool with which to clothe them. These are the results of a great industry that owes its success to modern methods and the untiring efforts of the rancher in the breeding and raising of Western sheep. <laughs>